And um, uh, I got the theme ready. Okay. Uh, whenever you're ready. All right. Here we go. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Don't panic. The world is not coming to an end. The power of nature over man has so been diminished over the ages that it requires an event of such enormous scale to remind us of its even being present. We can imagine it to be a new trend in the working of the earth, but such imagining forgets all of human history. Uh, mankind has been at the mercy of nature for most of our existence upon the planet. It is only recently we have mastered it to the point of assigning it to be a negligible nuisance. In doing so, we have populated areas of the planet that once were free of people, built large cities where only small villages once stood, and all can seem suitable and stable for civilization to survive with minimal interference from nature until we are rudely reminded that our view of history is limited to but a sliver of geologic time. And the last week brought us just such a reminder. It started with one of the largest magnitudes of tectonic motion that shook the homes and skyscrapers designed by engineers who understood well the force with which the earth can quake. And so... What for many nations would have been a natural disaster of horrific proportions was to the Japanese an expected event, predicted, prepared for, and prevented from being a large-scale tragedy. A triumph of man's ingenuity over nature. Of course, what followed in the wake of the shake was something that uh, in this day and age can truly only be described as a natural disaster, a tsunami so powerful that it will redefine the force of nature for a generation. A natural disaster this time, but a man-made disaster if it is allowed to happen again without attempting to mitigate its potential damage. And still there linger lingers a truly man-made disaster, as fears of nuclear fallout are let fly and mainstream media melts facts down into plutonium teasers, the true damage may be to the energy future of the world. If we let our ignorance of isotopes inflate the danger of radioactive rain clouds heading to the U.S. shores, it will impact the fortitude of future generations to generate carbon-free energy and will keep us reliant on carbon-filled, radioactive, rich coal, despite its clear and present consequences. So as we admire the engineering conquests of the Japanese in their uh, conquest over nature, we uh, also watch with anticipation as they take the unprecedented challenge of cooling media reaction and containing the collateral damage of world opinion on nuclear safety. We will continue irritating your brains with uh, free radical news that took place this week in science. Coming up next. Day, Justin and Andrew. Hey, Justin, how are you? I'm doing pretty awesome. Had a nice St. Patty's Day dinner and a uh, little Irish uh, coffee. A lot of Irish nice. coffee. Been trying to wake up with it, get my day started. I think the best part about Irish food is you can mix all of it up by by any component. It's a lot like Mexican food. Like you can you can throw your Irish coffee right in your corned beef and cabbage. It's gonna taste the same. Yeah. It's a, it's not the apparently the Irish don't eat any of that uh, corned beef and cabbage stuff. They don't. They're like no, no. We we had to do that when we had to boil our meat and everything when there was like famine going on like a hundred years ago. But we uh, we've moved on. Knock that off, uh, yeah. Andrew. Uh, you there? Yes, sir. I am. I am wearing green, by the way. Unlike uh, apparently you two. No, this is no, green. Yeah, he, oh, he's wearing green. green. I'm sorry. Green. Uh, and I, I in, in interest of disclosure, totally randomly, it was the one clean shirt I had after our 10-day sojourn to Texas, and it happened to have green in it, so. Oh. 
Oh, uh, I'm wearing green. What are you talking about? As, as I bite down on, on the green pen. Uh, well, I, I'll tell you what. It's, it's an honor for me and Andrew to be on the show and uh, be filling in while uh, Dr. Kiki uh, continues to uh, be on, on maternity leave. Yeah, she's really milking it. <laughs> At this point, geez, how long? Come on, you can't do a <laughs> podcast? <laughs> no, I, the kid doesn't need her every moment of the day, but, you know, new moms, she'll figure it out. <laughs> Within a month, the kid will be over in the corner playing with matches while she does the oh. show. Her, her child oh, is quite tweeting. articulate. Yeah, look at that. Baby uh, Nano Kai on, uh, on Twitter is uh, tweeting about uh, being breastfed by Dr. Kiki. So look at that. Oh. Nice. It's just, that's, a, that's a kid growing up in the technology age. Yeah. Exactly. They grow up so fast. I hear that they start tweeting in the in actually in the second trimester, and then by, <laughs> by the third trimester they register for the B board on uh, on 4chan. I right, suggest so uh, for the for the audience members who are uh, not familiar with you, this is uh, Justin Robert Young. You work on a you do another show on Twit the uh, NSFW. That's it. That is, that is what it's called. Uh, NSFW I do with Brian Brushwood Tuesdays at 10 o'clock on, on the Twit Network. And I've also uh, you know, done uh, uh, down, down at South by Southwest. I helped Brian out with some of the live coverage, and I did a Dragon Con. But uh, that's where you guys would know me from Twit. But other than that, I uh, also, with Brian and Andrew, host a podcast called Weird Things, which is kind of our take on weird science stuff that is both uh, you know, real and maybe some pseudoscience paranormal scenarios that we walk through as skeptical science minded individuals. We, we try to uh, give it our best walk through. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like we don't believe in Bigfoot. We just think that he totally rules. So would that, would that sum it up correctly, Andrew? Speak for yourself. I believe he's real. Oh, OK. I OK. Hope. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, would, I would never make such a sweeping pronouncement to say that he's not real. Ah, uh, OK. OK. Well, yes, there's no current evidence for bigfoot or at least anything. not a shred not a not shred a but there is evidence there is evidence for a monkey cat in borneo all right part monkey Here part cat go. they actually have photographs of it i don't know whether to call it a mat or a monkey <laughs> was I was think this I'm gonna the, go with a the there was just the cat that was using the monkey cry to lure monkeys to sort of a sense of uh, ease where it could then sneak up on them and eat them Ooh, that'd be pretty clever. No, no, no. This one is wow. Oh, this totally is the new uh, monkey cat. This is the uh, yeah. It's it's like a lemur with the head of a cat. I'm I've, I'm, I'm looking this up. <laughs> just Borneo searching. Kalimantan. They've only taken a couple quick snapshots of it. We better get started with this week in science, though. Uh, I thought that was science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, monkey I think cat. We should do that one on your show, actually. I don't know. I think I think we can spin off after after this show, folks. Stay around for this week in Monkey Cats. <laughs> yeah, here, here's the problem: is these these hard rules you have. You know this. This is science. This isn't. I say, listen, man. Um, if you type in Monkey Cat into uh, Google, actually Borneo Monkey Cat, you get a bunch of very adorable images. That's oh. delightful. I say, let's let's just pour that Monkey Cat right into the rest of the science, like my Irish coffee in the corned beef and cabbage, and let's. Let's get this St. Patrick's Day episode of rolling. <laughs> monkey, well, that's oh, where that's monkey cats adorable. come from. Oh, that's, that's, how they, that's, that's how they first came about. Oh. Yeah, that's sweet. <laughs> and then six months later, it started tweeting. Yes. <laughs> so for, right off the top here, we got to figure. We got to explain to people what's going on in Japan. Because yes. I've been. The news out there is insane. Wait, wait, and you don't think the audience knows what's going on in Japan? Is there anybody out there who has no idea what's going on in Japan? Well, I don't think they do because, uh, well, first of all, there, they had an earthquake uh, a couple days ago, I think. And uh, after that, a tsunami. Um, yeah. And, and the media has sort of moved on from that. And this is extremely focused on a, 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 a nuclear reactor, and is hyping well, this nu- hyping this up to the point where, where you would think this is, this is the precursor to nuclear winter. 
this is this is going to this is going to bore a hole through the earth that's going to pop up in like the Midwest somewhere <laughs> with a hot hot reactor core that you heard it here first we're going on the Rick and Science, folks. Yeah, that somehow we're going to have radioactive material um, floating over in the airstream, the jet stream, some, somehow, and irradiating the entire West Coast. There are people taking. There's been a, a huge run on uh, potassium iodide. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which, yes. <laughs> with the idea that by filling up your thyroid, yeah, you could prevent um, so it from taking up uh, uh, radioactive isotopes. <laughs> but that's really if you're within within the neighborhood. You you need that if you're within the neighborhood of this plant. Uh, more likely what that's going to do if you're going to take that and uh, here on the west coast of the United States is you're going to give yourself an elevated chance of having a heart attack. Well, you I'll, could I'll tell you yourself. what. I mean, you, you say heart attack. I say one step, uh, one precautionary measure from keeping me turning into the toxic Avenger, uh, Mr. Justin Jackson. Uh, if, if, I, if I could defend the media, though, real quick on this. You know, one of the, I mean, the tenets of journalism is proximity. So this is an element of what is a global story that is affecting the United States theoretically. Obviously, you know, they're saying that, you know, there's a, a plume of, of radioactivity which might hit the West Coast. And, uh, you know, it could have some effect, I mean, negligible most likely. But I think that's the reason why we're starting to see the media uh, fixate on that element of it because this tangibly, at least more so than the earthquakes and the tsunamis, uh, affect the United States specifically, so it's it shouldn't be a shock that the American media is focusing on that and the people coming in by plane. And you know, I guess in uh, Dallas and Chicago, they had people setting off the the radioactive uh, uh, you know alarms or whatever. Uh, so I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that there's certainly a lot of education that can be done, but it shouldn't be too much of a shock that we're talking you know, about. The, it. Another element too is that the it's the uncertainty where you get. You get the mixed reports and you get the idea that TEPCO hasn't exactly as forthcoming about, you know, is there water cooling it down? Is there not? Are the precautions working? Which regardless of, you know, how much, how effective that radiation would be dispersed over a large area and how much damage it would be, that, that makes people uneasy when the people who are in charge. We saw this with BP. When the people who are in charge don't seem to be doing their job in charge, they get nervous. I know people buying iodine. I don't know of anybody who's actually taking it right now, but I know people on the West Coast are, have this fear that, you know, if, if you get some huge plume that goes up into the Gulf Stream, it'll spew on over. Of course, you know, none of that would come anywhere close to what, you know, was given off in Nevada and blew over throughout the 50s and 60s. But no, in any it, event, it's nothing it's nothing close to what we put out today. Oh, already. yeah. Globally from coal and all that. Of course yeah. not. Of course not. We, of course it, not. Because what they're talking about right now is water that has contacted the rods has been turned to steam. It's been vaporized. It's what's being vaporized. It's mm-hmm. it's going up in the atmosphere. That's not going up in the high atmosphere even. That's not going to be in the jet stream. But even if some element of that got into the jet stream, came all the way over, it would fall into the background and be not even a negligible, not a small chance of it will have zero chance of harming anybody on the West Coast of the United States. Um, To put this also into some kind of a context, if you took all the uh, radioactive material that they're using to generate the power in these plants, all the, all the uh, radioactive material, not the steam off of, but the actual material itself, vaporized all of that, it would still be less than the number of I- isotopes that we release in our coal-burning uh, power plants in a year. I mean, e- even if you were actually taking the nuclear material, those rods, and dispersing yeah. them in the atmosphere, it's... So the idea that steam off of these is somehow going to create any kind of a concern, health concern. Well, uh, just, anyway. Justin, I'm I'm with I'm I'm very much a, a don't panic kind of guy, but there is there is the, the also the waste rods. There's the other material, the mox pools, and the other stuff there. You know, if if in the stuff that gets released, the cesium releases that would contaminate the countryside. There are things besides just that uranium in the pool there that are cause for concern. And um, I, I'm with you this. I mean, we we ignore you know how much you know radiation we get every time we fly in a plane. How much radiation is just like you said from coal production, all this sort of stuff. And it's it, you know, it's the media's illiteracy when it comes to science. I mean, that that's part of a big problem. They want to have a story to report. But right. I mean, but, it, well, I, it, it's I guarantee more you when when the uh, 
when the <laughs> the steam settles and uh, this thing is put to bed, and it will be. I you know, uh, if one if if the Japanese can't handle. If the Japanese don't have the engineers to handle a uh, a reactor that's that's in trouble, then yeah, we should cancel all nuclear power plants everywhere in the world. <laughs> we should just because they're well, they, they they've got the they've got the technology and the brain power there to handle this. Yeah, and, I, and there know, was there was one upsetting part part of it is that the reason these are in meltdown right now is because somebody got the plugs wrong. I didn't hear that. Yeah, so it was it was a maintenance issue. You know that this is it, it's not a problem with. I mean, although this is a, a very old reactor, it was uh, you know the the care for it that went from here to there that has left it in this kind of situation. So uh, I definitely think. I mean, like, like you said before, I mean there are are way more harmful ways to create energy other than nuclear power, and I'm I'm, I'm very glad that uh, we haven't seen at least yet in you know uh by people who can really swing a big stick a demonizing of nuclear power mm-hmm. andrew yeah, real quick, I, yeah, here's, I, I think, here's the breakdown that i got for uh for how this how this got started okay earthquake earthquake uh actually took out power to the plant mm-hmm. uh no problem backup generators on the site immediately came online took over uh tsunami hit flooded out the backup generators okay um the backup to the backup generators uh, started co- doing, uh, taking over the operation. These are these batteries that are actually built into the facility. Um, Attacked and by a swarm of bees that actually hours. feeds on batteries. <laughs> that one, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, so that worked for about eight hours. And in the meantime, they brought, they brought in portable emergency backup to the backup of the backup generators, brought those in, and couldn't plug them in because the interface was different. So those international they, plugs, they'll get you every time. International plugs. They'd never yeah. tested it. They'd never field yeah. tested the backup to the backup of the backup. And uh, as a result, they added, started adding the, the, uh, the seawater. The seawater, when, when, uh, when that gets uh, turned to steam, has a lot more hydrogen released. That's what we saw exploding. Uh, a bunch of pressurized hydrogen caught fire somehow, and poof. Uh, blew out walls and ceilings, which may actually be a good thing because now we can airdrop water onto these these locations. But uh, the yeah, the, it's a localized problem. Still, it's not gonna. It's not an international problem. It's the the real tragedy still is the tsunami, and it's already done its damage. Although, yeah, although a, I'll tell you what, I mean, they, they still continue to have those earthquakes. I mean, you know, I know that if anybody, yeah. I'll tell you, this has been you know, a tremendous. Uh, example in in the power of Twitter and social media yet again. I mean, I know that for me, ninety percent of all my information on the blow by blow came from friends of mine that were in Japan that w- that were that were tweeting about it and just you know seeing uh, aftershock after aftershock after aftershock and and what they were being warned about uh, was just was just terrifying. But you know, I think in terms of uh, in terms of this, obviously, this is the story that is sizzling now. With you know, pardon the pun, now in terms of newsworthiness, you know, it is. Like, like you said, the tsunami's done its damage. The earthquakes are continuing, but are lessening in severity. This is something that could still rise to be a, a bigger problem than it is, which is, I think, why we're, we're focusing on it. But, uh, you know, like you said, I mean, it's thankfully there are, you know, uh, uh, podcasts like this where, you know, uh, somebody who's not super informed like myself can learn something and uh, go tell their panicking parents that they don't need to uh, go buy <laughs> you know, a 16-pack of iodine pills and slam them with their green beer tonight. And if your parents do that, they'll probably be okay. The, the scary thing for me is uh, this is uh, the, the, it's a potentially very lethal substance. And, and people are, who, who they're going to be most concerned about, who's going to be most vulnerable to this is going to be kids. So people who have kids and are worried about their kids becoming irradi- irradiated because they've been watching the news and they've been showing the, the, uh, the graphic of the radioactive cloud and what what time it's going to reach the west coast to the united states and uh they're going to be giving this to children and one of the problems with any kind of medication is at least in the american market uh, we seem to think that more is always better which in this case more could could kill somebody and i think we i think we're going to find uh that uh, there will be a result that deaths as a result of this uh of this <laughs> cloud of steam 
as it arrives here, and it's going to be from the drugs people take to try to avoid getting poisoned. Uh, if I could add just one postscript on this uh, before we move on. Uh, at, at a certain, I mean, I guess probably the ages of 9 to 14, when all I did at the you know my school's library was check out the uh, hardbound uh, Marvel origin comics, you know, over and over and over again and read, you know, the, the Fantastic Four origin. If I lived in California at this point, I would be stealing my parents' car and driving to where it was projected that that cloud would hit the most, uh, you know, the, the most devastatingly and just hoping, hoping beyond hope for my superpower to finally manifest. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, I want to be able to spin web, so I'm going to keep a spider in this pocket. And exactly. I can jump really high, so I've got a frog over here in this pocket. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, wouldn't it be cool to fly and suck blood? Hey, I'm going to get some mosquitoes with me, too. There we go. It's just, yeah, just me rolling down. That's the most disappointing down. thing about radiation, though. Gosh. Really would be awesome. It doesn't actually give you superpowers. Powers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe this time. Maybe we had to wait for the Japanese blend. All right. Well, but really, uh, but really, I don't know. I guess, I guess my, I guess my, I've just, I've been really irritated with the all the pretty much all the reporting that I've heard on the uh, on the, the nuclear uh, situation over there. Because it's almost like they're saying things like that. It's almost like, uh, and it looks like uh, because of the result of this, uh, there may be many mutants uh, with superpowers being formed in Japan as we speak, and you know they might as well have been reporting that because it's just as accurate. It is absolutely just as accurate to have that nonsense versus the nonsense of people getting killed by this. Well, I think you know, partly it's it's uh, you know in terms of, of which kind of media that you're that you're referring to, which is part of the reason why the internet is such a beautiful News. thing, is that we are we are able to uh, drill down to people that have more of an idea of what they're talking about than what we were provided with before. If you look at you know radio and television broadcast or or print broadcast, I mean coming up through. Uh, a journalism school. I know a lot of people who are working at at major news outlets, and I can tell you that their science knowledge is not far beyond what mine is. And and that's why I like to hang out with guys like Andrew Main, uh, because he can uh, you know be be a lot more uh, focused on on stuff like this. And you know I, it shouldn't be a surprise that that they're not you know necessarily the most literate in terms of diagnosing what the threat is and how it can affect people because. In general, you're just kind of hearing half truths in any sort of crisis scenario, and, and it's up to really, right. really oh, good reporters to stop throwing. You're right. We're screwed either way because we can't trust. The, we don't trust our energy companies. Nobody trusts the freaking government to say the right thing anymore. <laughs> Nobody trusts the the Japanese government saying that is no problem. Nobody trusts the company over there in charge. Nobody trusts our government when our government tells us that we don't have anything to worry about. So who do? How how do we get a scientist? How do we get a couple of physicists up there? actually explaining the situation that's what I'd like. I, I, we need, the thing, like i mean i i every time i turn on the news though there is a physicist there's somebody there and then you get somebody giving you the worst case and sounds the best case scenario i think they're all over the news and they're not saying the same things because i mean i think that it's part of it's the information coming out of there i mean i i've i've not seen a lack of that yeah i've i've, I've i haven't seen any on any of the uh, news reports that i've seen at least i haven't been seeing that i've been seeing a lot of the hype um but maybe I'm watching. Maybe I'm watching the wrong channels. What are you watching, <laughs> Justin? I watch. I watch. Uh, actually, I don't even have my I, my TV doesn't get channels. But this is all from being at work, where we have a TV on in the background, and it's probably mostly Fox News and CNN. Those are probably the two that are on the most there. Well, you know, remember that they got they got to fill a lot of time there. So uh, you know, it's. It's, there's 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 never any guarantee on on, on who's going to be on, but I mean, in general, I haven't caught a lot of broadcast news, so I, I would defer to you know, anybody else in, in in this troika that that has. But in general, I mean, I, I feel like you know I've I've gotten I've gotten links from trusted sources of people that I know you know personally that uh, whose opinions I trust on other things, and I feel like this this disaster uh, and and really, I mean, pretty much everything that's happened throughout 2011 in terms of major. Uh, you know, revolutions and, and this, you know, the disaster in Japan. I feel like I've been way more informed than I, than I have been at any other point in history uh, just because I'm able to connect with, with people that I trust, that I know are going to feed me good information. 
Now, uh, Justin Jackson, do you have like I have like there are there are like probably two people, two science reporters that I will defer to who I absolutely trust their judgment on this stuff. Do you have, you know, people you go to for the stuff that you go, OK, you know, this person makes sense of it or is there people you would recommend? Um, no, I'm just shooting straight from the gut on right. all of this. This is just I'm just going by instinct. All right. Yeah. Way to go on a science show. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a recommendation here as uh, Ron Bailey, who writes for Reason Reason dot com. Ronald Bailey, he's uh, handles a lot of energy issues, a lot of stuff like that, and he's a he's a he's a very very smart guy and a really good guy to read on this stuff. And he's you know so I, I've been reading his stuff on that. He's a pretty good article that came up yesterday about. Uh, referencing a Daily Beast article about how, you know, if we pull back from nuclear, you know, in the last three years, we've been finding more and more natural gas. So it's it's not going to be so much a retreat to coal as much as a treat to natural gas, which is a much better alternative than coal. And uh, he gets into two. Ron's talked a bit about some of the alternatives. And like, yeah, I think the problem here isn't necessarily nuclear power. It's using a an effectively a 50 year old nuclear reactor design. You know, we've, we've got better ways to build them now. And he talks about some of the thorium reactors and some of those other stuff. And it's really amazing what we could do now if we wanted to build much more efficient, much safer nuclear reactors. But as you pointed out, if you count the number of deaths in any given year from coal, coal exposure or mining, you know, accidents, whatever, it far exceeds than even than, you know, the number of people who've died, you know, from nuclear reactors. Right. And, and you get extrapolated to nearly half a million a year. Yeah. Is, yeah. What, I, is what I've heard. I mean, it, it's really that ob- obscene. But we continue with it because it is our chief source, uh, largely uh, a very large source of our electricity mm-hmm. in this country. And I do have a, I do have a source on uh, nuclear issues. Whenever anything nuclear is being talked about, it's uh, 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 Dr. Bill on KGL. Okay. He's, uh, he's always had the correct answer when I've gone after the fact and, and followed up and researched and tried to find out if he was wrong when I didn't agree with him. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, it's like, oh, okay, yeah. And there's, you know, there's, uh, there's, phys- uh, there's physicists out there um, who will tell you at, at great length, um, the older guys, uh, their displeasure in what happened to, to nuclear power, to the mm-hmm. rap that it got, um, to, the, to the, it being wrapped up with the peace movement, is and you know the hype of the the things like the Three Mile Island and even Chernobyl um, as being the example of of what's to come with with nuclear power, and and a lot of that you know the anti nuclear movement though was you know didn't come from an anti intellectual group you know that came from campuses and universities and many of their peers and that's that's sort of the frustrating part it's not a thing where it's easy to say that it's a a right or a left issue or whatever. And, and you know, you've, you've first, fortunately you've seen some people kind of seen the light in nuclear power, you know, and say, well, you know, if you want clean and you need practical, this is the way to go. And and I, I think we're, we're seeing, you know, the Obama administration, you know, said that we're going to continue on to the program that we have and trying to develop new nuclear power. And I think, I don't think we're going to get as much of a knee-jerk reaction as we're afraid of. I yeah, hope. hopefully, hopefully not. Hopefully not. And, and we've got the, we've got the uh, right head in the Department of Energy, We've got we've got folks who who will have Maybe. level heads through this, but we're still not building them like we should be. I mean, we need to be we need to be make we need to be turning one of these these on one a, one a month. I'm with you. Not I'm absolutely with you. Years. Yeah. Yeah. What I, I, say, I say two a month. <laughs> Let's double it, down. You know, an yeah, interesting article. Let's do it. An interesting article, too, talked about one of the problems was that, you know, Japan's noted for, you know, developing robotics for handling earthquakes and a lot of different kinds of scenarios. And the question was, why aren't they using robots for this? And I guess one of the things they do in modern reactor design is they actually design them for robotics to be able to go in through there. But since this is such an old design, it wasn't as easy. You know, they didn't, you know, there's there's no no system in place that can go on and solve this. And that's going to be an interesting thing to come out of this. I think that, you know, when you had uh, the, was, I, I was in Japan when they had the Kobe earthquakes. And after that, you started to see some technological development to try to develop, you know, 
tools for handling finding survivors and earthquakes. And now after this, I think we're going to be looking into more, you know, what can you use with robotics in situations where, you know, you've got helicopters flying over there that you've got lead shielding on the ground of the floor of the helicopters. So these pilots can be safe when they spend a few minutes over there. And that's the state of the art right now is something we could have done 60 years ago. Meanwhile, we've got predator drone aircraft that can fly 300 miles by themselves, target individuals and take them out with precision. And that's the state of the art there. You would think that we would have, you know, an equivalent sort of way to handle disasters like this. But and you nailed we, it, too, though. The, uh, that facility is uh, from the 70s. Um, the, the, so it's the, the access to the facility wasn't with a lot of the things that we could do in mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so and, I think the ones in the future will be much safer anyhow. Yes. Use Kryptonium. Hmm. Or we could just do we could we could we what we should do is just borrow that thing that they used in the uh in the BP Gulf spill. Remember that big that big cap they kept dropping on it? <laughs> the thing that kept not working? Yeah. 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 Just take well, one maybe, of those. Maybe it was the water. Lift it that over was and just problem. drop it. It was like sealed. Everything's fine. There's well, something well, going on underneath. No, that would, that would actually be the worst. You'd effectively make a pipe bomb. Because remember, the purpose yeah. of the water is the continued use of the water to cool it down. Because otherwise it keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And then, then, that, then you actually get. It's almost what we did with the, uh, well, it's almost what we did with the seawater. Is we released we released a whole bunch of helium in a pressurized area because that steam is normally in that pressurized area, but it's you know it's not nearly <laughs> it's not didn't have the explosive factor, and that's why we lost the walls and the roofs to the thing. Yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna cool down by itself, so it's not one of those things that they can just cap and walk away with. Well, gonna, it, it, it will in like two hundred thousand years, I think. I got to make sure the the K right there. And, you know, it's it's interesting. We've got uh, like just point. We got some friends there in Japan, and uh, you know they're still getting tremors. They're still getting like six point one tremors there, which those are enormous. I mean, six yeah, point, and, yeah. That, high, and and they talk about how they just sort of have just sort of don't pay attention to them. They're just so used to that now. And how you know when the new normal is that that's frightening. Yeah, I know. I know. I was looking at the uh, the little USGS uh, site that has that shows the tremors, and I, I kept seeing another six, another five point five, another six point one that were going on within the last hour. That I was looking at this thing, and I'm like, "Wow, me is that normal, or is that is that all related to the aftershockness?" Thankfully, you know, the California is going to be pretty safe from the earthquake situation. Like the, or the tsunami situation. Our, we, we had the good sense to put all of our faults uh, on land and, and far in enough. Um, well, however. Unless you, unless you live in Coachella, then you're, you know, then you got a problem. However, uh, the Oregon coast is, you know, there's, there's a, there's a uh, geological record of a 50-foot wave tsunami hitting that actually made it all the way that's got you know left residue all the way into, uh, to where actually portland is today oh wow they well, have I moved a, from there yeah they have a the, one of the things is they they first noticed this actually it was two different things that they were investigating one is how they ended up with all of this uh ocean floor residue uh whatever detritus that they were finding in the in the the layers uh as far in as oregon and it's like was that under the water was that part of the sea basin how come it was lifted up or we don't know what why that is and then it was correlated to uh this uh, a, a bunch of ridge lines or mountains that had old growth you know 100 100 plus year old uh, trees and then for the bottom 50 feet or so it was all relatively new growth and they they did figure out that it was a massive tsunami then they correlated when that tsunami happened. It was sometime in the 1600s they figured out this thing happened. Hmm. And they found a record in Japan of, uh, that correlated with the time that this all hit, the Pacific Northwest, of a nine-foot uh, tsunami wave. Wow. So, you know, we had, we had a couple, <laughs> I don't know if we even had a couple feet rise on this side uh, based on, on this one. They had approximately a nine-foot wave on that side. 50-foot wave in the Pacific Northwest. So, you know, the tsunami situation that we just witnessed 
we could see a much worse version of that in the Pacific Northwest because it's precedented. It has happened before. And it's not an earthquake that's, um, that's really happened. I guess there was, you know, you get the occasional bursts almost up there through Eureka and what have you. We had one of those, I think, in the, the 30s or 40s. But you look at the Pacific Rim, and the San Andreas c- continues to move. We had further south in Mexico, uh, Guatemala, and on the other side, this, this, the constant, but now this really big one in Japan. And I haven't heard much from the Pacific Northwest. I'm wondering if uh, we may lose the Pacific Northwest to something like this. Ah, uh, geez! Don't bring all the smiles at once, Jeez, Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's well, you know, it's an interesting to thing. The Pacific is... Northwest, too. I like that area of the country. It's not like it's Texas. I mean, I can't. All right, calm down Wait about Texas. Second. What? But you, you bring an interesting point about how historically, you know, we're we're just now beginning to understand how frequent these events are. And you know, the problem you had before is, in order to have a historical record of something, you had to have people around to keep track of that. And, you know, there's a reason why flood myths are one of the most pervasive myths in just about every culture, and it's because of events like this. And, you know, you talk about 100-year floods, and there's a reason there are, you know, they're called 100-year floods. It's long enough for people to forget, and then they happen, and they wipe things out. And, you know, as we try to build more permanent civilizations, and much better than we did before, you know, we, it's helpful to remember, you know, these things have happened before, and they happen far worse. And then, like you pointed out earlier, you look at these, you know, these less developed countries that are totally unprepared for this. And if you've been to Japan, you see how much, how conscious they are of the idea that they live on, you know, the Pacific Rim, that earthquakes are reality there, and they build accordingly to that. And it's, you know, certainly if, if you want to uh, want to make the case for industrialization, it's, you know, look how well, you know, they survived this versus lesser developed countries have had, you know, far, far, far. And, and, and the, the loss of life in Japan is still catastrophic. We're still figuring out how much it is. But, you know. But it's tsunami driven. It's not earthquake driven. And that's why that's why I would say that uh, something like uh, something like Haiti, uh, the earthquake that that was so devastating there was really a man-made disaster, because that was a that was an event that was we knew that we know that's an earthquake uh, zone, the the mm-hmm. folks living there there, and the fact that they weren't able to prepare for it means it was a man-made disaster, not a natural one. Um, the the situation in Japan. It's not a natural disaster, or it's not a man-made disaster. It was just an event, and they survived it. And it was, you know, something that comes with the territory. The tsunami is something different. Tsunami is just that was an incredible amount of uh, uh, that was that was an incredible event, which they weren't prepared for. But we'll have to be, and they they were they were like part of the way prepared for it. I mean, where those a lot of that tsunami wave hit, there were uh, more, higher than eight foot uh, seawalls, eight to ten foot seawalls that were supposed to be out there breaking that stuff up, but they weren't uh, prepared for something of this magnitude. Well, and, and and you know I don't know what the uh, you know now all the the geologists are talking about how you know they're they're having to throw out the book as far as prediction or thinking about how much impact a nine point I mean that's what it got up here a nine point earthquake is you know you hear about seven you hear about eight it's it's not. It's not linear, that scale, no. that power, you know, and so that's to think about when you talk about, oh, you know, can we endure an eight, you know, can we do, you know, 7.1 to an eight? And then, you know, what that means is, you know, is that a, I don't know, but is that a, you know, a once in a 300 year thing? And, you know, when you hear once in a 300 years, you think you got 300 years to prepare, but that's no, it means any given time in 300 years that can happen. Yeah. And that's only because we've. You know, we, we make a lot of these predictions, and uh, we haven't been around a lot of the no, planet no. for 300 years. I mean, that's the thing with the Pacific Northwest. Uh, if an event like that happened 400 years ago, there were not that many people around to witness it or to be aware of it. And if they didn't survive, there was nobody to report it. So yeah, the the, event- the, the, yeah, the, the few survivors you would have would scatter and, and, you know, move on, and new people would come into there. and. You know, that, that's sort of uh, – that, that's a thing that, you know, archaeologists are now trying to understand is just, you know, what causes displacement, you know, what happens. And, you know, the when you go look at like a map of the world, going back just through human history, it changes radically. I mean, there was, you know, within human history, England and France and, you know, parts of Europe were connected within human history. 
you know, you could you could walk across parts of that, and you had catastrophic events that slowly parts of it, and then suddenly changed that. And you know, the same thing with the Americas is you know we're still trying to understand what happened here, and you know we can find certain things out in Asia because the Chinese kept very good records, and so did the Japanese to an extent. But as you said, other parts of the world, hell. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> monkey cat. All right, so let's go to the show notes. We've got, uh, what's the, uh, you brought some stories. What kind of stories did you bring? Well, I'll tell you, you what, one... Justin, uh, in, if uh, the Pacific Northwest does get wiped out, there might be a chance that we can tell us in the past that it's going to happen. In fact, that might be what's happening right now. At least that's if the latest theory by Tom Wheeler and Choi Man Ho is correct. The Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest atom smasher that started regular operation last year, could be the first machine capable of causing matter to travel backwards in time. Our theory wait, is a long... wait, wait. That is a fantastic teaser. Uh-huh. See, that's a teaser I like. Now we can go to a break and be waiting with anticipation for an incredibly good story. As opposed to the uh, the nuclear uh, teasers that we we're doing before, we got to take a break. I just realized what time it is. We'll come back with the uh, we'll come back with a thing that's going to save your life in just a moment. Do you like audiobooks? If so, you can get yourself a free one. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 75,000 different titles in a variety of uh, genres. Twist has found many science-based books in this Audible library, by the way. We have done, in fact, I I no longer actually even read books. I now listen to books. Uh, Mostly to preserve my eyesight, because I've noticed that people who read a lot of books tend to have poor vision. And in an effort to protect my, my, the longevity of my vision, I've switched over entirely to Audible books. You can actually get a free trial today. Uh, get any audiobook downloaded for free. All you have to do is sign up at audiblepodcast.com backslash twist. To get the audiblepodcast.com twist uh, now uh, free, on, uh, free for a download. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Oh, also, uh, we have a uh, book that is to be determined for the uh, Twist Book Club. Uh, it's going to be our, I guess that was the March, uh, April book of the month. So go to twist.org to get your copy and join the conversation about the book that we haven't determined what it is yet. You know what? It's going to be Gospel awesome, book. though. It's going to be, you know what? It's going to be my book. I'm gonna, we're going to put my book up there as the... Uh, it's the April book of the month so that uh, everybody can read my book and then we can have a conversation about how good it is. And I will be uh, administering the conversation. So. <laughs> yeah, I, li- I like that. It's a, it's a little like, kickback scheme to yourself. Yeah, it's it's like, like, uh, uh, by the way, it's like Justin the Kim Jackson needs Jung. to wet his beak. It's like the Kim right. L. Jung Club. For, yeah, forget the other sponsors. I'll just create my own product. <laughs> what the heck? Yeah, I'm gonna, I, I, got, I got two letters to plug. M-E. Welcome to you the party, what? everybody. You know, Buy if my advertising, book. you know, if advertising really is really going to work, if uh, if it's worth it for some advertiser to pay me so many cents per person that that goes and buys a product or investigates product with them, then certainly I can make a better turnover on that dollar by just selling something myself, right? There we go. I think you're onto something there, Jason. I think anybody who's selling advertising instead of their own product is defrauding the people who are uh, spending the advertising dollar with them. <laughs> <laughs> or at uh, least right. they should have their own product somewhere in there. Like, uh, what's his name? Uh, the Glenn Beck. He's got that gold company, right? Does he own the gold company? Yeah, yeah. He's like, he's got like massive shares of this company. He's like, yeah, I always buy my gold from these people. It's a good idea. You should do it too. And it's all, then they send them, like, the grandmother's dentures melted down, and, uh, 
Yeah. All right. All right. All right. I, so, I like I like where you're going how with else, this. Okay. How else that was you that, get a, that was okay. A fully we'll figure this out. Car. We'll have to do it with something else. We'll have to take over the silver market or something. The Hunt brothers tried that and it didn't work out so well for them. So silver just doubled. It was like at sixteen. Now it's at thirty four, thirty five or something. This it's if you put your money in silver six months ago when I for, uh, forgot to to tell you to do it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I want to subscribe to your newsletter, sir. Hey, listen, uh, I forgot to mail this out, but if you'd done what I was going to tell you to do, would have worked uh, out. Man. Maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, Justin, if uh, we had lived in a world where uh, Doctor Wheeler or Professor Wheeler and Choi Man Ho's theory had been proven correct that the Large Hadron Collider could wait, send wait, wait, matter wait, wait. back that's through the time, pre- okay, so that's we're, the not teaser. we're not now back yet. We're not back. Oh my God! It's still commercialing. We still. This is a commercial. Still, these are still important messages that nobody can make. But uh, we should go back to the show with uh, backtro music now. And we're back with more This Week in Science. I am your host, Justin, with your host, Justin, and your host, Andrew. Here Hello. Today Hello. And uh, before we head into the break, Justin was uh, beginning to tell us that the Large Hadron Collider may have potential as a time machine. Huh? At least, at least a time machine of thor- of sorts. Uh, if our theory is uh, a long shot, admits uh, Professor Wheeler, who is a physics uh, professor at Vanderbilt University, but it doesn't violate any law- uh, laws of physics or experimental constraints. One of the major goals of the Hadron Collider is to find the elusive Higgins or Higgs boson, the particle that physicists invoke to explain why particles like protons, neutrons, and electrons have mass. If the collider succeeds in producing the Higgs boson, some scientists including the two that we're talking about right now, predict that they will create a second particle, the Higgs singlet, at the same time. According to the theory, these singlets have the ability to jump into an extra fifth dimension where they can move either forward or backward in time and reappear in the future or the past, Wheeler says. One of the attractive things about this approach to time travel is that it avoids all the big paradoxes because time travel is limited to those special particles it is not possible for a man to travel back in time and murder one of his own parents before he himself is born, for example. However, if scientists can control the production of Higgs singlets, they might be able to send messages to the past or the future. Right. And then you could get the paradox back just that easy. The paradox I was just going to say, yeah, the sex paradox sex. comes back real quickly in this uh, quote here. Yeah, yeah. I like, I, we can't send a man, but we can certainly send information. Well, that is the paradox, is the information transmission. I mean, <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want to be the killjoy here. You know, I'm, I'm all yeah. for this. I think they no. should, like, say that they've got a receiver and be like, oh, yeah, it's working, and, uh, and thank you for the Nobel. Yeah, thank you very much for that. <laughs> and, uh, well, actually, that's all you have to do. You could invent a, a time machine uh, based on, like, a tachyon pulse today by creating, uh, creating a device that uh, is just the detector. It's just the receiver. Right. And you put it out in space somewhere, and you just put it out there, and it's like, okay, that's the receiver, and it's going to ping us as soon as the future comes up with the technology the ping back right. in time. They can aim it back in time at where that satellite is, and then we can. And as soon as you build it and put it up there, it'll start working. Well, well, I've, I've like, on the I'm Weird really. Things podcast. I've told Justin about my plan. I, I did a very low tech version of that when I was ten. Nice. And I, I buried a. Uh, I took a uh, one of those plastic Easter eggs and I buried a note to people in the future asking them to come get me because I was really really bored. <laughs> I'm work? still here. No, no, it did not work. Uh, my brother ran over it with a lawnmower, destroying my experimental apparatus. 
Uh, I'll tell you what, though. I do like the fact that uh, the, the lead professors on this theory go right to the paradoxes about murdering your own father. <laughs> you to murder your father yeah. because you didn't like your choice of becoming a scientist. Exactly, I know. <laughs> if, like, some unexplored rage issues for Professor Wheeler that I'm sure the <laughs> students of Vanderbilt are well aware of. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll tell you, what, I love I love stuff like this, and it's it's one of those things that uh, you know I don't know I just I, uh, for some reason like I, I just I just want like this I, I always want to keep asking people about this like every day I just want to keep calling them like oh does it work yet Have you gotten anything from the future All right, same even, time even tomorrow. Better, we should call them up on like a really statically line and go stop what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, uh, that's that's already places. happened. <laughs> that's actually taken place. Oh. Exactly. There was there was a guy uh, who showed up who was apparently speaking somewhat strangely, wearing a tweed jacket and perhaps a bow tie. Uh, showed up at the facilities of the Large Hadron Collider, claimed to be from the future, and was like, "Yeah, you shouldn't really run this thing because it's going to have this horrible side effect that's going to ripple out in time into the future and it's going to be, you know." And they're like, "Okay, okay, all right, okay. Well, um, can you wait in this room?" And we're just going to lock the door, and we'll be back to get all the information from you in just a little bit. And uh, so they called the they called security, <laughs> and the security shows up, and they go into the room, and the man was gone. Totally true story. Absolute totally true fact. story. Yeah. Exactly. Absolute fact. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, and that's that's uh, you know, he, he only the only uh, trace of him being there at all was him signing the uh, the security form to get in. As Samuel Clemens. Oh, is that true? I didn't catch that part. Oh my I gosh, know. I didn't know it was him. <laughs> yeah, look at that. It's <laughs> the third time, sense. man. He knows. He knows sense. about catching uh, catching the river of time. Well, yeah, he's uh, well. I mean, I'm surprised he got back so soon, though. I know he's been zipping around out there on Healy's Comet for a while. Sure, why not? Now he's a party animal. That guy. He goes where the where the where the motion in the ocean is. <laughs> You, do you know the Halley's Comet reference, Justin? No, I don't. I don't know the Halley's Comet reference, Andrew. Yeah, that was uh, when uh, Samuel Clemens was born, a.k.a. Mark Twain, uh, was the year of Halley's Comet, and he said that he was going to go out when it left and when it came back again. There you we go. It. A little fun fact from history. I thought I always liked it. I liked it, Jackson. I, I thought it was, that was right. cool. Well, it's a, yeah. I, it's okay. See, normally I can say these things, and it's what's great is that you actually caught the reference. But uh, usually <laughs> I can say stuff on the show that just seems like nonsense. But then there's the, there's people in the audience, like all of my <clears throat> all of my side comments register with ten percent or less of the audience. But it's not the same ten percent every time. So eventually everybody gets something that I say. <laughs> yeah. No, that's <laughs> enough, good. Enough so to maintain an audience. I, I'm Just embarrassed to admit, stuff. I probably remembered that from, like, a Star Trek The Next Generation episode with, that's, with him. That's where he what pretty that much out. the entire chat room is pointing out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was it I'm on the Star Trek? I actually got it from uh, from books back when I used to read them. Oh, come on, in the books already. Why done. hold that over us? Oh, you read I'm books? You, oh, no, reading is passe, my friend. <clears throat> it's Did over. you listen to the I'm commercial? We all well, listen back. to them now. Yeah, we I got listen, it from a but... from a March seventeenth, two thousand eleven episode of This Week in Science myself. <laughs> and there we go. There is uh, there is old Mark Twain uh, hanging out with uh, Jordy LaForge and Data. And I thought they could never figure out why he wore the fake nose and the weird fake mustache and eyebrows. But other than that, <laughs> you know, he was a pretty interesting guy. He was eccentric, very much so. Mm. What do we got? Do we have any more science stories? Did you guys bring anything else? Uh, I've, got a, yeah. I've got a bunch here. Funny enough, uh, the growing cloud of space junk surrounding Earth is a hazard to space flight and it will only get worse as large pieces of debris collide and fragment. But uh, NASA space scientists have a new way to manage the mess. Yes, folks, mid-powered lasers to shoot those balls of junk out of the sky <laughs> and into orbit is the new way that we can keep the skies clean and make space travel safer as we continue to explore outside of our planet. Mm -hmm. This is a serious issue. This is, I mean, 
this is a massive problem that we could we could end up getting grounded on planet Earth by having too much stuff blow up <laughs> up there. And because every little bit of debris that's moving at like 186,000 miles an hour has the potential to take out a satellite or uh, a space vessel as it's trying to trying to get in or out of orbit. So yeah, lasers. Why not? Lasers can move stuff around, heat it up. I think, yeah, no, I think this is definitely the way to go. I mean, you know, number one, it's you know, we always we always talk about like oh, you know, people are uh, you, you worry about people losing fascination with space right or or that you know kids don't have the kind of connection with nasa that uh you know they, they, they maybe once had in generations past what better way you know if you walk up to an eight-year-old right now and say you can grow up to be a <laughs> astronaut that shoots lasers at junk who's not going to be extremely excited for that down. They'll probably let robots do it, though. They're going to let the robots have all the fun, like shooting Kill lasers joy. in space. Kill joy. <laughs> hey, man, I, I want to be there, all right? I'm with you. I can't help it if they're just going to, like, you know, it's going to be one of the first jobs we argue with robots over that they take from us. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. I hear that, you know, the different plans for, like, you know, getting orbital debris. I, sure. Do it. You know, absolutely. Um, for sure. Uh, you know, last how, how week, did... just last week, Justin, and I actually got to talk to a. Uh, uh, Richard Garriott, who uh, was up in space, and we should have asked him about that. You know, that was a fear, you know, coming back, going, spending all that money to go up in space and then have, like, you know, a wing nut from some Sputnik thing just taking out your whole adventure. That would suck. That would yeah, really not that be would, cool. That would be terrible. <laughs> yeah, apparently, and just to under, uh, underline how big of an issue this really is, uh, Low Earth orbit has already seen some scary smashes and near misses, including the collision of two communication satellites in 2009. Fragments from that collision nearly hit the International Space Station a few months mm-hmm. later. Uh, some models found that the runaway Kessler syndrome, which is what they call uh, all these, uh, you know, maybe the doomsday scenario of all this space junk kind of uh, combining and making things really, really dangerous, is probably already underway in certain orbit elevations. Well, back so up, this you is see not- that photo? You see that photo there? Evidently, we're going to use Klingon birds of prey to take this stuff out. All right. Finally, what else yeah. are we going to do with those? Well, I heard that like originally, like the Russians had offered, like you know, you know, to do it, like you know, to get the contract for doing that. Which now the Klingons are up for it. I'm totally, pretty cool. much totally. the same thing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, uh, this story comes from Wired, by the way. If anybody wants to go read it. Yeah, well, we had and we had conniption fits a little while ago when the when the uh, Chinese were practicing on blowing up satellites up there. Yeah, um, nobody had explained to them like how what a bad idea that is. Well, but, the, yeah. I don't think they wanted to blow up their own satellites. I think the goal yeah. is to be able to blow up ours. So, I mean, well, that that's the uh, that's the you know the the. the the uh, you know the, the, in China you know the the state of their aerospace and much of their military technology is how do you disable Western technology? How do you take out Western satellites? How do you just you know, instead of trying to blow up an aircraft carrier, how do you use a torpedo that can take out the screws so the thing is just dead in the water? And that's that's an efficient, effective way to invest your your money. Yeah, but, but they're still it. borrowing our telemetry data and everything else to, to go up there <laughs> and to, to figure out we, when to launch. It's like please don't mess up. Is that what, is we actually have a crew that maps where all this junk is. Yeah. We, sold them the rocket the, technology, we sold them the rocket technology in the 90s for their missiles. So, you know, at least we made a dime off of it. <laughs> I don't mind, actually. You know, if the Chinese took over uh, the world, uh, we, you know, we'd be all right. Yeah, yeah forget free speech. Worse. Yeah, forget sure. free speech. And, and yeah, they just finally made cheating on your taxes not a crime punishable by death. So it sounds very progressive to me. Well, you know, I mean, that's where um, that's where uh, that's where all our our jobs are now. Anyway, I mean, we'd basically just be following, you know, employment if we went to China. Uh, I, I I think they have a they have a, an incredible their economy is an incredible story, you know. But this was the story we you know they're different than Japan, but that was the story we heard in the eighties about Japan, and you know, for them to reach that level, you understand that you know the unprecedented growth they have to have has to continue on at this rate for thirty years at that same level, which. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, I'm I'm excited about the prospect of over a billion people being lifted out of poverty and moving into an industrialized role. I think that's exciting as far as, 
you know, what, what the shape of the future is going to be with that. I have, I couldn't predict. We're very bad at that at figuring out what things are. I vote for freedom and liberty. And lasers. And, and lasers. Uh, and bananas. Yeah. And bananas. Whoa, 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 sure. what about bananas there, Justin? Uh, yeah, they've, uh, they've got a new use. We're used to the banana, which is one of the earlier genetically modified foods. Uh, we're used to it being used for uh, food. Comedy. Right? Comedy acts, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. slipping, on the, uh, slipping on the banana peel or... Yeah. Mar uh, Mario Kart, an underrated uh, accessory there. Very nice. But, and apparently it's good at polishing silverware. Oh, yeah. yeah. I never... You knew that? Uh, no, I don't. I, I didn't, rather. I know it now, but uh, it, it definitely seems like some... Uh, you know, a helpful no hint, you know, in, in a Martha Stewart book. Yeah. But uh, that, that now it sounds it's, uh, like something that's true. That's something that's true. But this is, yeah. a, th this is a new find, though. It's uh, one of the most effective uh, materials for water purification. Huh. Yeah, they uh, added it to drinking water contaminated with potentially toxic metals. And uh, the scientists here found that the minced banana peels... Perform better than any array of other purification materials wow. tested. Hmm. That's that's super yeah. cool. I mean, because you always see with, with genetic modified foods where it has the most dramatic impact is are, are in the poorer countries, and those are also countries where you know clean drinking water is a major, 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 major issue. So, you know, if if uh, you know we can genetically engineer bananas that can get cleaner water, that seems to uh, you know be knocking you know. Well, uh, wait, 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 wait. You know, somebody. Market. Somebody in the chat room pointed this out, and, you know, bananas are slightly radioactive. I think it has something to do with the potassium. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> we, let's, let's not jump all over these bananas just yet, okay? <laughs> hey, wait a second. Wait a second. You're going to get a nasty letter from the, from the banana industry. Exactly. Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Chiquita are going to be very <laughs> upset with one Andrew Maine. They're, they're going to take the hat off to write the letter. All right, they have to find <laughs> me first, all right? <laughs> Oh, my goodness. So this is a general industrial and engineering chemistry research. I can peel a yeah. banana off my toes. Sorry. <laughs> can you really? Hold on. Do you have one there? No, you don't need the, you don't need the photographic proof, Justin. <laughs> yeah, we do. Oh, we want to oh, see don't a we? live. We want to see a live ahead. banana show. I, I, I don't, I don't want to. Uh, yeah, I, I am part chimp. And so just out of curiosity, I was eating a banana. I wanted to know, could I just eat one with my feet and peel it? And it was frighteningly successful. So. Yeah, all right. So the the chat room has asked for this. So for the audio listeners, um, <laughs> imagine imagine a man that looks like Hugh Jackman. <laughs> There's the point. That is actually for those if I can describe it. There is Andrew with a uh, uh, his right hand turned up, you know, palm up, and his left hand itching his scalp like an ape, and a uh, a frighteningly fist like grip on a banana <laughs> down below. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, but no. This is. I mean, this definitely seems. Uh, this seems like 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 a win win, and it's really it, it's. You know, I think uh, much like nuclear power, uh, genetically modified foods is something that I think the science, uh, you know, the bears you know very solid evidence that it's something that can can help uh, a large populace of, of people who need it the most, and uh, it unfortunately kind of gets demonized a little bit uh in you know some circles and i think that's really uh it's really a shame when it gets kind of saddled with you know this sort of uh franken food straw man argument yeah, well, yeah no, I, it's we have modified cr crops that uh have been created to resist pests funguses viruses even in their seeds uh to last longer on shelves and the end result uh will be less starvation on our planet and and you can and it, you can actually make a very decent argument for Monsanto being an evil corporation that doesn't care about local farmers. Um, sure. Okay. But the local farmers are not going to feed the population we're going to have in 25 years. It's not yeah, going to work the way they've yeah, done it, it in the past. You're absolutely right. You know, one of the, the, one of the most important people in history is Norman Borlaug, who, you know, we should have a Norman Borlaug day, and this is the guy that basically saved, you know, probably half of the developing world through developing, you know, stuff that led to 
you know, the, the agrarian revolution, you know, the agricultural revolution. And, the, and it's 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 frightening because to this day, if you want to talk about what's the most pressing issue as far as, far as affecting, you know, humans, longevity, whatnot, it's it's right now it's the it's the. The, the most the most pressing scientific issue is the anti scientific attitude towards genetically modified food, GM foods, and you have industrialized countries, particularly Europe, pressuring developing countries not to use these things, giving them incentives, threatening not to import their goods, telling them people not telling them not to do that, and because of their own, you know, aesthetic value or belief in it, and that's causing the deaths of millions of people every year. Millions of people are dying right now, and it's a thing that gets sort of ignored because you know, it's it's a thing where we have this sort of green sort of idea of what that's supposed to mean while people who are can't afford to shop at Whole Foods like us don't have that choice and are dying. Yeah, and as and it studies have shown even the, the Whole Foods at Whole Foods, even the organics are, are being grown on land that was once riddled with DDT three, four, five years ago. It's there. It's not. It's it, there's no there's no perfect scenario even for what we're eating. No. All food is genetically modified. Whether we do it through breeding or through making it actual adjustments to its genetic code uh, in seed form, it does not make a difference. We're breeder. It, basically, when you when you put different types of plants to get different kinds of things together to make these hybrids, you're doing it randomly, uh, or you're doing it in a lab. And even then, it's it's trial and error. I think we're at the end of the show. Show. Um, I should uh, I should say that uh, it was it was great fun having both of you here. Uh, I want to thank everybody who was listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is available as a podcast. You can search for us in This Week in Science in the iTunes uh, directory. Or if you have an Android device, you can look for Twist for Droid, Twist number four Droid app in the Android marketplace. For uh, more information on anything you heard today, show notes will be available on our website, www.twist.org. We also want to hear from you, so email us at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or justin at thisweekinscience.com. Make sure you put twists somewhere in the subject matter, otherwise it will not get past our robot overlords. You can also contact us on Twitter at Dr. Kiki or at JacksonFly. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover, address a suggestion for an interview, an insider stock tip, please let us know. <laughs> Be here again next week. We hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from tonight's show, remember, it's all in your head. Bring back Kiki. Bring back Kiki. <laughs> Bring back Kiki. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science 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 This Week in Science This Week in Science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. jeopardy. And this week in science is coming away. Everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got me Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 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 This week in science This week in science This week in science Science Science
Got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational Well, so glad uh, that's song over. Song I just can't lingers keep that and lingers. Robot I forgot. Up. Oh, my God, the robot rising. No.